studying chymotrypsin and writing out glycolysis pathway intermediates or not. Um, but if not, then uh, you still have four days to do it, right? Um, midterm is Friday. Uh, I will remind you that um, the second quiz will be online active uh, right after this class. And if you do uh, online on Friday, sorry, on Wednesday, uh, one minute before class, right? So before class starts, close down. So you have those these next two days to complete the multiple choice quiz on um, the last four lectures, including today. And then Wednesday is the review session for the midterm. There's no new material. And um, I will not come with anything really prepared. So it'll what we do will depend on what you guys ask me to do. Okay. Uh, we can look at the quizzes. If, uh, if there are questions, we can look at book problems. We can put whatever you guys want. OK, um, so we left off last time in the middle of the glycolytic pathway, having discussed some of the bigger picture stuff in the first part of class, and then starting to work our way through the enzymes. And we got about halfway through. We worked on the mechanism of this key enzyme that splits uh, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate on the top there uh, into the two products, glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate and dihydroxyacetone phosphate, by way of a carbon-carbon bond cleavage reaction that goes through a carbanion, right? And the carbanion is stabilized uh, by virtue of resonance with the shift base form of the enzyme that forms the first part of the reaction. Okay, that's a mouthful. So, um, recall there's a deprotonated enzyme lysine that starts it off by attacking this C2 carbon, which got here by way of phosphohexose isomerase in step two, right? Because glucose would have the aldehyde and the basically carbonyl group at step one, at, at position one. So if you move it to position two, you're set up to cleave by this mechanism. So this attack by a lysine generates this protonated shift base intermediate. And then here, when a base on the enzyme removes this proton, it forms its transient carbanion right there. Okay. And so how that looks um, mechanistically drawn out a little bit more, not that this is a stable intermediate or anything, but just so you see it. Um, here's the base picking off the proton. And um, as, the elect as, this, as this bond breaks, the carbine ion builds up here. And then this, because you go to a double bond here, this can leave as an aldehyde. So the first product is leaving here. Right? And um, this carbanion ion that forms uh, on here is stabilized by resonance by virtue of this shift base intermediate. Right? So here's, that, here's the resonance that sta helps this stabilize. Right, and then it goes from here to form the enamine intermediate, and then the second part of the reaction is water coming in to basically reverse the steps. Okay, so that's shown here. Here's water coming in. Water split off in the first part, so we add it back in the second part. <coughs> the lysine is released so that the enzyme is restored to its free catalytic state, okay? So you don't have to draw this all out from scratch. I may ask you some questions about it, show you show your structure in the middle of it and ask what's going on, that kind of thing. Questions about alveolase. <coughs> so alveolase is forming these two products, right? It's forming uh, G3P and DHAP, if I can abbreviate them. Okay. And as we discussed before, Another part of the logic of the pathway is that only this guy goes forward, right? But if this guy goes forward in the next step, this guy does not, but if there's an interconversion of this to this by virtue of another enzyme, then as this is depleted, this enzyme, this will move over here by mass action. So that's, that's the dri thermodynamic driver for uh, trials phosphate isomerase, which is step five, the enzyme here, the two products, here's all the lace the mechanism we just talked about. Here are the two products. This enzyme interconverts them. Right? If this one goes forward in the, in the glycolysis pathway into step six, this one does not. So as soon as it forms, it goes forward into step six, leaving 
this in molar excess to be converted to water, and then this goes, and then this goes. So all the carbons and glucose go through the pathway. It's just that after the cleavage reaction, three of them are stuck in a compound that has to be converted to the other one, the other part of the cleavage reaction, and then, the and then it all goes forward. So it's very efficient, right? You add one more enzyme into the pathway, and you get to use both products of glycolysis by you know, converting them. Then all the rest of the pathway can just be one thing, even though you got two products with a six carbon sugar, right? So that's efficient. I mean, we could have imagined a cell where we got these two, three carbon compounds, and they were pretty different from each other, and then they both had to be processed separately, so you need this set of enzymes and another set of enzymes, but it doesn't work that way. Okay. So that's that's a that's a part of the logic, and the other part of the logic is moving the carbonyl to C two so that that carbon carbon bond change can happen. Right. So that's set up that C double bond O at C two is set up as an electrophilic center that carbon <coughs> lysing to attack and form the ship, <coughs> which is then the electron sink for the carbon ion that forms the cleave next door. So that's step five. All right, so here are steps one through five. Okay. So we have G3, one through four, really. G3P, DHAP forming. The inner conversion at the top, where only G3P goes through, and now we've got, notice we've got this little number two here, indicating that there's two of them per glucose, so this path is per glucose, right? If you don't remember that these twos happen, then you end up getting ATP arithmetic wrong, and that's a really not, not a good thing to get to, to mistake because it's so easy. Right? Just remember that they're all twos. Okay, so now we've got five more steps. We're here at glyc two molecules of glyceraldehyde three phosphate. This is now called the payoff phase because we're going to be able to make some ATP. Recall the first part was sort of the investment of the preparatory phase. We actually invested two ATPs. Yeah? I just want to make sure I'm understanding clear. If you say it's two ATP per run, does that mean per run of the three carbons or um, just in total it's two carbons? Per run of a glucose molecule. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, so these numbers are based on one glucose molecule going through. All right, so the next step is a redox reaction. It's the only redox reaction in the pathway. Right? And so it's quite important because it forms an ADH. We looked at the structure of nicotinamide cofactors, and so we know, even though we haven't studied it yet, that NADH is reduced, it's, a, it's equivalent to being a high energy compound, it's going to be able to transfer its electrons down an electron transport chain, and ultimately allow for the, for the synthesis of ATP by oxidative phosphorylation. So here's the formation of it in glycolysis. This is the only NADH that forms in glycolysis. The reaction is, is between G3P and inorganic phosphate to form this 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate compound, which is a product, which is one of the glycerate, which is a, a key glycolytic intermediate. Right, so we've got an acyl phosphate here, right? And we can say that this is, this is certainly a high energy linkage, right? Because if we hydrolyze it to delta G, zero prime is strong and negative, high and negative. Right? And we saw the example of that actually when we talked about bioenergetics. Um, so, we're going to be able to use this linkage um, to make ATP. Okay, so we've got now, by virtue of this reaction with inorganic phosphate, we've got a, a, a three-carbon sugar with two phosphates on it. Right? So this is where you start to think, okay, we really it's good that there's some magnesium around the cell to help balance these two phosphates on one pretty small molecule. Right? So the mechanism of this, we don't to really look at the extreme details of the reaction. Um, but the overall um, enzyme is, ac is actually an example of a ping pong mechanism. Okay, you call a ping pong mechanism is one where uh, one substrate has to, one product has to leave before another substrate binds. Okay, but that that happens later on in the pathway. So the way this enzyme works, it starts out with a thiolate on the enzyme, pKa of cysteine is eight. Right, so we're starting here with a with a negatively charged cysteine, even though um, it might be running at pH 7. So uh, uh, P, there's a little pKa shift on that cysteine. Right? So that thiolate, which is a good nucleophile, attacks the aldehyde of G3P, goes through a tetra 